I think it's high time to start. Today we have a session which was uh, bilingual and uh, those who understand only Russian have picked up the headsets uh, for simultaneous translation. We're a little bit late because uh, even at the Bolshoi Theater at Amhat, uh, there's a slight delay so that people could enter the room and I think that there'll be more people coming. Today we have a very exciting, as I believe, uh, session and uh, an extremely exciting panel. We'll talk about uh, the new trends, but more than that, today we'll talk about the criticism that has been leveled recently against the leading business schools and against the leading programs. And now I'll switch to English so that our colleagues, and we have representatives from the world's leading business schools, so that they understand what I'm saying. But what is happening at the business schools of the world? What is happening at the MBA program? And just recently, yesterday, at the International Advisory Board of our Academy, our foreign participants were speaking about the necessity to redesign MBA programs at the key product of business schools. And we are lucky today to have fantastic experts at our discussion. First of all, next to me is sitting world famous Santiago Ingues, a member of the International Advisory Board of our Academy. He is executive uh, president of EYE University, very famous Spanish university, and also for many years he used to be a dean of business school, EA business school that is one of five or six leading business schools of Europe and the world, with number one by Financial Times ranking online blended MBA program. Santiago wrote several outstanding books about the recent trends in business education of the world, and so we asked him to share his experience with us. And simultaneously with Santiago, today we have several outstanding experts. This is Ruben Vardanyan. I consider that in our, uh, <laughs> among our people, there is no necessity to introduce Ruben Vardanyan. It's, it's the brand name. Everyone knows this man who, who created fantastic business, who helped a lot to the development of business education of Russia and recently Armenia, and uh, who, who is uh, participating uh, in uh, Gaidar Forum sessions. And we are very thankful to Ruben Vardanyan. Next to Ruben Vardanyan, Eric Lamarck is sitting, also outstanding man. Eric Lamarck is the dean of business school of Sarbona One. Uh, if you know Sarbona University consists of four parts, the uh, leading one and the one that is connected with management and education, this Sarbona One located in Paris. Uh, so, so he's the dean and plus to this, he's also the chair of the Association of Business Schools of Public Universities of France. Being a president of Rabbi, I can say that this is plus minus equivalent. So we have lots of things in common when we are discussing the problems of business education national wise as a whole. And I'm very thankful to Eric for uh, that he agrees uh, to be with us. And finally, the last but not the least, is sitting Ilya Daronov, uh, who is today the head of TV department of RBK or RBK TV. Plus to this, to the extent I know the biography of Ilya, he tried himself in business. He's a fantastic professor because uh, we, we had a chance to invite him to the discussion club of IBS Moscow for our alumni and he made their great presentation and has a lot of outstanding ideas about the development of business education. About our format, I consider we shall kindly ask Santiago 
to speak about 35 minutes. Then we shall provide an opportunity for three of our speakers to share their perception for 10, 12 minutes each. And then there would be an open microphone where you shall ask your questions, make your remarks. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, outstanding experts who are present here, they, 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 they would answer the questions, make extra comments, and we shall get what, what today we say 360 degrees understanding of the problem. На этом я свое вступительное слово заканчиваю. And it's my greatest pleasure to give floor to our main expert, to the executive uh, president of EE Business School and outstanding writer and professor, our great friend, Professor Santiago Ingues. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I may stand if you agree. Yeah, if you please. And, uh, talk. Есть у нас переносной микрофон. Do we have a mic for Santiago? Thanks very much, uh, Sergey, for your very nice words. Uh, I have to apologize first for not being able to uh, convey my presentation in Russian as I would have liked, but I promise that next time at least uh, I will say a few words in your very nice language. And I'm honored to, to, to share this panel here with such uh, renowned people like uh, Ruben Bardanian, who's actually a reference worldwide of entrepreneurship and philanthropy, as well as, as with my colleagues, uh, Eric, who's doing a terrific job there in France, and of course, Ilya, who's a respected journalist. Anyway, uh, what I would like is, and I apologize, Sergei, since I'm backing you, but um, what I would like is um, to share with you some thoughts and some experiences at IE uh, Business School and IE University with some takeaways, because I always uh, believe that uh, uh, the idea of these presentations at the very renowned and respected Gaidar Forum is not just uh, to speculate about uh, what we may do, but actually to try to uh, formulate some very particular recommendations for action. So let me start by sharing with you something. I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak about three major things following the title of the uh, conference, of this uh, panel. The first one is going to deal with young, young generations, and uh, I find many representatives here, many youngsters who may probably discuss or question my proposals. Then I will deal with the impact of technology in education. And finally, I will uh, comment on executive education, corporate universities, and the role of universities in this particular segment. But let me start by sharing with you an anecdote that happened to me just uh, one year ago. I teach uh, corporate strategy at IE Business School. And uh, I use this uh, blended format that allows me uh, to teach uh, from many distant places. So we use a very interactive uh, streaming system that I will comment afterwards. But during the first session of the program, when I was uh, explaining the syllabus and telling my students about uh, the different case studies that we were going to discuss over the program, I was very proud because I had uh, picked very innovative companies, uh, very updated uh, case studies. You know that uh, many times business schools, particularly professors, are criticized because they sometimes use the same case studies that are picked from the Harvard Business uh, School Library. So I was very proud because uh, the, the sample of case studies was very diverse and shown many different latitudes and countries and industries. But then one of the participants, one of the students who was uh, British, uh, male, white, he said, uh, well, professor, Thanks very much, but all the CEOs of these companies that we are going to deal with are Western and male. And uh, he was very right. I mean, I didn't actually realize that all the case studies that I had uh, picked for the program were uh, led by uh, men uh, who were mostly Westerners. 
And uh, it made me think a lot uh, because, uh, of course, reality, uh, the, the current world, is not that diverse. And if we look at uh, boards or we look at uh, the CEO office, we still miss lots of women at the forefront and we miss more, much more diversity. And in fact, I went overnight uh, through the uh, library of case studies at Harvard Business School and I found that only 11% of their case studies uh, portray women at the forefront of their companies. And most of them are actually dealing with uh, the glass ceiling a phenomenon that you are probably aware of, uh, but there were just two case studies where the women, where the CEOs were women. They were General Motors and IBM. So I picked one of them uh, in order to follow uh, the advice of this uh, student. But my point goes beyond just uh, the fact that we still miss lots of women in case studies and uh, at, at, at board, uh, uh, at the composition of uh, corporate boards or at the forefront of companies. My point has to do with the purpose of business schools and universities at large. So should we just uh, tell how the reality is or should we actually deal with how the reality should be? Because academia and universities don't just uh, describe things, but they have a normative role. Uh, we have the moral duty to tell our students and our colleagues how we should change the institutions in order that they are fairer, that they are more just, that they actually uh, change the world for the better. So my first point in this presentation is precisely this one. I guess we need to produce much more normative uh, discussion at business schools and uh, at universities. We live, as you know well, and many analysts say in a post-truth, post-global, post-certain world where many different things are actually questioned. In fact, something which is quite contradictory or paradoxical is that as we know more things and we have access to almost infinite information, uh, is uncertainty has actually increased. And decision-making at many companies is becoming a more complex and more difficult phenomenon. And this is something we have to deal with because we all thought that uh, having all those uh, algorithms in place, the role of CEOs and managers it was going to become much more easier. But the fact is that taking decisions today at all sorts of organizations is becoming even more difficult, even more complex. Uh, in addition, we all know the role of uh, social networks, and the social networks are producing lots of noise. There's very few social networks that are actually reliable in terms of the information that they convey. And I very much encourage you to exercise your uh, critical sense, your uh, criticism against uh, most of the pieces of news that you may receive through social networks. And uh, we just produced a book, uh, and this is actually a reading because it comprises uh, contributions from different deans and uh, authors of, different of, of, of se uh, several business schools that show that the best remedy precisely to uh, uh, confront this complexity in the current world is doing good business. Good business is the best possible antidote to bad international politics. Uh, doing business across frontiers, across borders, is actually a way of uh, building up a much more cohesive global society. And what we show in this book is that despite all these problems in trade, the, the discussions that are now taking place uh, between uh, political representatives, companies do business effectively. And they actually uh, overcome all the different obstacles that they may confront in this uh, current scenario. There's uh, very good news, and uh, this is the fact that uh, the millennials and the young generations today are very much uh, global. Their profile is very cosmopolitan. They are also very much uh, friends of uh, new technologies, and they are becoming much more entrepreneurial and freelance than previous generations. So despite all this uh, discussion about whether we are attending a reversal in globalization, 
I'm very hopeful because what we find in class is that uh, the young students are bringing this uh, fresh air of globalization, of commitment, of global responsibility, and uh, this embracement of technology and entrepreneurship. Let me just share some of the features that we find in millennials. And uh, I wonder whether, particularly the youngsters who are in the uh, back rows in this auditorium share these ideas. But what we find, and this is something that we all share, we all agree, is that they are very comfortable with the technology. They are natives in this particular field, in digital skills. They have uh, a very clear, distinctive orientation towards working in teams. They are very much focused on productivity and not spending long hours, long days at work. They very much focus on results, which is something which is particularly good. They also value social responsibility and commitment, and we realize that they are the ones that are taking this flag of uh, sustainability and the defense of uh, the environment. And finally, they expect also defined careers and sometimes fast promotions. This might not be something positive, but to be very honest, this is something that we have instilled in them. Because when uh, we sometimes wonder why do millennials and youngsters expect to rotate, uh, to change companies in three, four years' time if they don't get promoted? Well, this is something that we have instilled sometimes in them at business schools. If you don't get a promotion, you should change jobs and uh, look for some other company. The fact is that research shows that those people that stay at the same company for a longer time have much better chances of climbing up positions and becoming CEOs at their respective organizations than those that uh, change more often. So this is uh, maybe a recommendation. If you are happy with your company and your bosses, then you may have much better chances of progressing if you remain in the same company over time. But let's uh, then uh, try to make some conclusions in this first part of the presentation. So given this profile among millennials, what uh, should we teach them? How should be our education at business schools? And I cannot deal with many different things, so I'm going to focus just on a particular item, which has to do with the spirit and the contents of education. So let me just uh, share with you the two major models that we may find uh, on a global scale about uh, contents, about uh, the philosophy of studies at universities. And you're probably familiar with uh, those two major models. The first one is the one that was uh, mostly developed in Europe and is also common uh, across uh, most European countries, including Russia, which is the specialized model. This was actually promoted in the 19th century by von Humboldt, Wilhelm von Humboldt, who believed that by specializing disciplines, by creating faculties and schools and departments, uh, we could actually deepen in the knowledge and in the research, and we could actually specialize the graduates so that they could access uh, jobs in a much more focused way. Of course, this system has rendered lots of positive things, and research over the past century has progressed immensely. And uh, the system actually provides, in general, good employability to those that uh, come out from our classes. The other system is the American, the Anglo-Saxon Anglo one, that you're probably familiar with as well, which focuses much more on the liberal arts curriculum, so that most students during the, third, uh, the, th the first three years of their studies at university normally pick many different courses, from literature to the arts to sociology, and they only get specialized in the second phase when they join a master's degree program or a juris doctor or an equivalent uh, sort of program. So my question here to all of you is, if you compare these two systems, this generalist one, the prevalent in America, which only becomes specialized in the second phase, and the European one, which one of the two actually produces more entrepreneurs? I guess the response is obvious, mm, because if we think about uh, 
the US and some other Anglo-Saxon environments, we realize that uh, probably entrepreneurship is very much uh, common across uh, those countries than elsewhere. And uh, this has actually been proven. If you look at the profile of many CEOs in Silicon Valley, they actually have a liberal arts education in the first uh, phase. They studied history or literature, and then they became specialized on the second uh, part of their degrees. So my first conclusion is actually uh, to share this model. This is what, for example, we are doing at IE Business School. We have an executive MBA with Brown University that combines the humanities with the traditional management areas. And my first conclusion of this presentation would be, well, let's focus on programs that combine both the humanities and the liberal arts curriculum along with specialization. Let me turn to the second part of the presentation that has to do with uh, technology and how it impacts education. And here, what I would like is uh, to uh, explain how technology can actually shape education in many different ways. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Watson, this device developed by IBM that produces lots of uh, very positive results, for example, uh, diagnosis uh, in um, all sorts of illnesses that are much more precise than traditional ways of uh, uh, making those diagnoses in, 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 in by uh, physicians and, and doctors. Google translators, narrative sciences, which is a device that can actually uh, generate articles which are much more consistent than the result of, with the permission of Ilya, uh, some journalists. So my thesis is actually that technology can humanize education. I'm talking here about the implementation of technology devices in the traditional processes of the learning activity. I'm not talking about uh, the massive online forms of delivery that are tutor-led, that are uh, low-cost, uh, cheap. That's a different segment. I'm not going to deal with that. That's uh, the area of MOOCs, of SPOCs, many other products. What I'm now talking is about blended programs that bring the best of technology as adapted to the traditional learning process. So if we think about education in the past, it was actually about conveying information and knowledge. People seated in class, in rows, and a master uh, teaching, delivering a master session, a lecture. But now education has changed in terms of paradigm because if we think about current arrangements where classes are uh, organized in a different way, both uh, physically as well as in terms of formats, we realize about the power of streaming and video conferencing. And again, I'm talking about top quality forms of, of streaming, not massive video conferences that don't uh, provide the same look and feel as a traditional classroom. If we think about many other uh, things that uh, relate to augmented reality that brings uh, top quality and uh, adapts education to the very uh, student. So the point is that actually technology uh, makes a change a dramatic change in terms of personalizing, uh, adapting, and making education much more collaborative. Let me uh, give you an example. Um, I, I sometimes wonder whether I uh, was not an architect, because my father's an architect, my brother's an architect, and when I was young, I dreamed about becoming an architect. Fortunately, I wasn't an architect, because I have fulfilled you know, my dreams in many other ways. But I couldn't actually draw. This is the main reason why I didn't try architecture. I was very clumsy, you know, with my hands. I cannot uh, hold, you know, a, a glass in public because I would throw it immediately. So today, with the current technology, I could actually draw and design fantastic buildings. So your handicaps are not an impediment in order to start any potential profession because technology makes available learning almost everything. You can learn maths, for example, by instead of using those exercises that we were accustomed in the past about one train departing from one city and uh, reaching, you know, its destination, we can actually now 
learn maths by using soccer examples or things coming from sports or any other affinity that you may have. So blended programs actually suit the needs of creative leaders and entrepreneurs in a much better way than what happened in the past. The good thing about technology applied in education today is that uh, if Bill Gates or Steve Jobs were actually attending business schools, they wouldn't leave the business school because they would find that uh, they can learn lots of things in a much more attractive way. For example, by using asynchronous and synchronous methods. For example, by using all these devices that are available now that uh, tell you how fast you learn that tell you how you can actually learn in, a, uh, in an entertaining way. We, for example, have uh, face recognition in our streaming devices so that the professor can actually know if the students are bored or are following the explanation. Of course, this can become sometimes very stressful because if the professor realizes that he's not entertaining his audience, you know, he may become a little bit, uh, you know, nervous. But anyway, all these devices enhance the learning process and make uh, the learning experience much more entertaining, much more effective, much more measurable. This is a picture of the WOW Room, which is a virtual auditorium that we have at IE University, from, from where we can, we can actually convey a very similar experience to what uh, you actually have in a face-to-face -face session. We still miss, you know, uh, smell, but I guess we can actually achieve, you know, the same, uh, the same sensation, you know, in the future very soon. So in sum, blended programs provide flexible, adaptive, friendly, enjoyable experiences. And uh, the thing is that if professors can actually learn how to manage this process, we don't need uh, robots. And I don't think that robots are going to replace pro professors. In fact, Bill Gates, in his first book, said that technology is not going to substitute uh, faculty. So maybe in the future we may have some adjunct faculty which is formed by uh, current devices or robots. But anyway, what becomes emperor, uh, the most important thing in the learning process is actually the experience and how the professor can orchestrate all these technologies in order to make uh, the learning uh, process and the class the best possible experience. So in some technology is humanizing education, is making education much more personalized and adaptive. This is my second takeaway. Develop blended programs, brings the uh, bring the best of technology into the learning process uh, because it can actually enhance the whole experience. And I'm now jumping into the last uh, part of the presentation, which is lifelong learning. So our corporate university is uh, threatening uh, the activity of uh, traditional universities. I don't think so, but let me explain why. If we look at uh, the manager's life cycle, and this is uh, a sort of summary of uh, what are the different phases of uh, the career of a manager, what we realize is that uh, probably universities focus their uh, offerings in the first, on the first phase, what is the junior career of a student. But they don't pay attention to the, list, uh, to, to, to the other stages that are going to become much more important because given the advances in neurobiology, and we realize that now by uh, using, for example, hormones, we can actually enhance sociability. We can not just grow our hair, but also we can actually become better leaders. And this is going to evolve in the future. In fact, we know that uh, the brain has this plasticity that uh, make uh, possible, for example, by studying, by attending a, a program, a master's degree in your uh, senior age, it can actually uh, regenerate your neurons. So this is a very interesting discovery because then retirement is not an option as we conceive it now anymore. I guess since uh, now middle age is uh, 60, uh, having 60 years old is like having 30 some decades ago. This means that probably what we need is to rethink our second life 
And uh, here's an opportunity which is fantastic for universities. <coughs> Let me just uh, finalize by uh, sharing with you an example, which is a joint venture that we launched with the FT, which uh, brings journalists uh, uh, along with uh, uh, executive education trainers in order to develop the skills and provide knowledge for senior executives in class. We need to rethink the mission of universities, and, and I guess that there's an opportunity here because the largest segment of population in the future is going to be the senior population. So it's not just an opportunity for universities, it's also a moral duty and also an immense opportunity in terms of uh, potential revenues and profits. So let me just finalize by sharing with you some pictures of our campus in Spain. This is the, uh, an aerial view of our <coughs> campus in Segovia, which is a monastery of the uh, 15th century. And then we have also facilities in Madrid. And we have a very exciting project, and I take this opportunity to invite you all to attend uh, the next opening of uh, our campus in Madrid, which is going to be a 35-story tall building in the northern extension of the capital. So this is what keeps me awake at night, because I wonder how we are going to be able to move uh, the 3,000 students across all these uh, floors. But we are now making simulations, and it seems it works. Anyway, thanks very much again for your attention, and I'll be delighted to respond to your questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santiago. Uh, j just before I shall give floor to Ruben Vardanian, I have one very, very simple quick question. Uh, thank you very much. You told me that I am 30 and a little bit plus, because 60 years means 30 years last century. And what about the people who are 30 now? Can I say that they are like 15 in the last century? <laughs> what do you think about that? No, uh, ab absolutely. I mean, uh, I guess that, uh, you know, there's some people that say they are not going to die. There was actually uh, one person, one reputed consultant in Spain who belonged to uh, this movement, Singularity, uh, which uh, said this. But I agree that life is becoming much more exciting. And of course, uh, what I would suggest is that uh, as we go to the gym in order to uh, be healthy in terms of our body and our muscles, we need to come back to class every three, five years in order to develop our brain because the brain is much more important than the body. Thank you very, very much. It's my pleasure to give Thank you very much once again, Santiago. It's my pleasure to give floor to an outstanding member of our society, an entrepreneur and businessman, to Mr. Ruben Vardanian. Good morning, everybody. Let Thank you very much. To make our colleagues easier to understand my grumbling deep voice, which is not every time easy to understand what I'm saying. Um, First of all, I want to say it was great to hear Santiago's presentation, which I admire, and I believe one of the best uh, example of the private initiative in education, because not everybody knows, but this is the private initiative. It was not uh, managed by government. It uh, started like private business school, and it's uh, grow up, become university now. It's instantly going from business school to university. It's also quite unusual uh, new trend. Um, but... Um, I'm also very thankful for invitations again for a nice word you said about me. Um, I will try to be a little bit provocative for today morning session, just wake up all of us. And I don't want to repeat, which mostly I agree with Santiago, what he said about the life learning and technology and the general education important. But I want to emphasize a couple um, important from my point of view, view uh, crisis is what we are facing in business education. I, I don't have too much time, and I don't want to go in many details, and I will go very briefly, but let's look at the past. When the business schools become very popular, it was 60s of the last century, and we're in America, and most of the people who were going to business school want to get knowledge about marketing, finance, some subject which was not very well educated in the universities or what very well in, you can get being engineer or after army. And the main professions which was being 
hiring this graduate was investment bankers and consultants. That's why I see the demand and supply was coming from a little bit different reality what we are facing today. And the question, is it today business school really responding the same way to the demand and supply which is today exists in the market or not? I think it's a big question. For example, I totally agree about the life learning is issue, but today we have 13,000 MBA programs worldwide, and most of these programs is uh, one program, and not how you measure the success of this uh, student graduation is not about how many of them came back to new program. It's not most of the ratings for today, Financial Times or any other very famous international newspaper looking the criteria which will confirm with this life learning, it will confirm with the school providing something which people feel very big value, and this is why we're coming back again and again to the same school to get education continuity. The second challenge, which we're talking about in life learning, is the self-discipline. You know, it was amazing statistics. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot speak Spanish, like, uh, despite I have a home in Spain, and this is the one of the challenges. It's a statistic about how people can learn in online language or not online, in, in general, if you want to learn language. 97% of people will learn language if you will be living in an environment where people, everybody speaks this language. If you live in Spain or in Santiago, will come in Russia, 97% chance that you will speak Russian after some period of time. If you're hiring a private teacher, 70% people will learn this language. If you are going in class, it's 50% will learn language. If you're doing by online, offline mixing, it's 30%. If you're doing online, it's only 5%. Which means we have a big issue about the self-discipline because life learning and developing of the skills which we today we need it is more how we can help our students to be more self-disciplined and going in a very difficult continuity type of education process, which means you need to learn all your life. And one of the measures of success will be not about how many diploma do you have, how you self-develop, which is was part of the antique by the way, time in the Roman Empire or Greek Empire was the question, but not how hard you work, how well you self-developing yourself. It's a very interesting criteria which not exist today in any other in our schools. The other challenge which we are facing today, and I think it's a, it's, it's a very important um, understanding of the, this is we need to rename the business schools. I think it's um, name it of the business school, create big uh, confusion. Most of the schools is uh, management schools. We are teaching how to be managers because most of the people who are graduating the business school is not entrepreneur. We are managers. And this is fine. We needed more managers. It's not, nothing bad about it. But it's creating illusion about it because entrepreneurship, unfortunately, confirming again and again, is not coming from the business school. Most of the people, especially today, we're entering in a world where it's younger people can start businesses cheaper enterprise and without any specific knowledge especially because of the barter, because of the technology, and many other accessibility. It's creating opportunity for many of the entrepreneurs going to the, entering to the business in age, which never before in the business school can touch, like 27 years was normally, the business school MBA student was normally in 27, 28 years old, after university, three, five years working, it's gone. The students, can, the, the entrepreneur can start in 18 years old, and just for understanding what happened, compared to 2000, 20 years ago, entry cost of the business was $5 million. Today, it's $500,000. Can you imagine, after 20 years, entering the business become 10 times cheaper? Second, but the barter and all this co-sharing, co-living, co-working is creating absolutely new type of the relationship, which is not allowing them, not getting a lot of things which you usually need to get is you want to get big industrial uh, company. The last point I want to say, because I don't want to go too many things, is um, about the new skills and the new challenges that we are facing. How well the school is responding to the, today's uh, new realities. For example, the privacy. We're talking about technology, but we're not talking about how technology is disrupting our privacy. Is a business school needs to be responding about this type of the issues or not? Or new skills, uh, translator or entrepreneur, and entrepreneur, inter uh, inter uh, inter uh, inter um, Pretty much, uh, there is a question. If we're talking about very general education, if we're going to take people with coming with very special knowledge, 
They don't understand each other. It's not a question of only English-Chinese translation. If today journalist, architecture, and business person will sit in the same room and talk about the same subject, we will not understand each other. Are we teaching the skills of the translator or understanding each other from this di different, absolutely, uh, backgrounds or not? Are we providing skills about, uh, for example, what's happened if the technology crash? We're all talking about technology like the panacea, but let's assume all this technological system will crash. How are you ready to work with the paper again or not? Do we need to teach about it or not? Because the bug or the bugs or some virus can destroy the system, and the, and people will be sitting and don't know. I have a my my friend my son friend couldn't come from Taganka to Ramana, which is all in center Moscow, because the GPS system didn't work and he couldn't drive the car because he didn't know how to drive from Taganka to Ramana because the GPS didn't work. Can you imagine for us, the people who is 50 or 60 years old, this will be a joke, right? We can we easily found. That's why I think the question is that we are responding to all the skills of uh, new, new realities which is facing the, or not. And the last thing I'll say is uh, very important is convergation of the business and, uh, phil and philanthropy. I think we're talking about something which is very important. The meaning of the, what we're doing becoming more and more critical. We're all hearing about this manifesto of the big corporations. We're talking about this. Overall, the capitalism is gone. You cannot just work for profit. It's clear for 21st century. Millennium will not work for, uh, only for profit. We want to, for meaning of life also becoming very important. This is why integration of the philanthropy, social activity, and business becoming one of the key challenges, which is most of the schools are not responding yet. They're touching the subject, but they're not doing methodological approach because one of the key problems is the measurement of success, how you measure the activities of the social impact, one of the most speculative areas of the uh, today uh, in our world. So I'll say integration of the differences and convergation of the business and philanthropy, uh, new skills of the reality of today, which we request coming, which we need to really provide for me in business school, to more name it management and try to help people to understand what life learning is a self-discipline, how we can help them to get this type of the really early entering from 16, 15 years old to until 90 years old, and I agree, education all his life, which means are you, we are ready for having the contract with the person with once a year, it needs to be once a month for education, means he is a one month a holiday, one month will be self development, which is absolutely new, new, new type of the contract we need to have in the corporation. Well, and many other points, I will I'll be happy to go more, but I don't want to steal the time from my other colleagues, which I'm sure can add a lot of other points. And I mean, thank you, Santiago, again for a fantastic, uh, interesting presentation, and I wish good luck with the finishing uh, the big building. It's very interesting, by the way. One other point I want to mention, last point I want to mention about the university. It was respond for monastery, right? Monastery was holding the knowledge, and the monastery was religion institution. Was basically university was non-religion same monastery concept. I mean, living outside of the main cities, outside of the, and was needs to be environment people can think along about a lot of things. We are now going more about network, more about activity and things. It's why we instantly going from the university like monastery to the network and activity in the main center of the capital of the cities. And this is also very interesting trend about the physical location of the, look what happened with this um, university of, um, who's doing the education in a different uh, part of the world now. It's not only just one place, it's going education in many places, but all in the main cities. And this is, uh, that's why I said that, uh, uh, University, it's, uh, it's very famous. We, well, he came to Lausanne to, sp to do his part. No, 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 I mean, the guy who was speaking about this program in different part of the world. Minero, I'm sorry. Minero, yeah, I just arrived from New Papua. I'm sorry, I just he <laughs> came yesterday. So my memory is not, in my time difference is not, yet. I may not recover fully. But say, Minero is a good example. The now students going around the world, not just in one place. We're going six places doing very We're talking about some network, psychological recovery, which one people going to, let's finalize my, my last pass point. Why people going to business school? Number one, network. Number two, psychological recovery of their own thoughts about themselves, some knowledge, some chance to do businesses, but it's less to, we don't have a criteria of business school. I, I remember they talk about Skolkova business school and we had a debate about how we measure the success. I say very simple. 
I don't care the student will get 2.5 or 4.2 for marketing or for finance in the exams. If during this education, the students will never be offered a job from his colleagues, he didn't offer anyone other to job to join him, nobody came and said, let's do jointly some new product, he failed or she failed because this is the point of the business education. If nobody wants to hire you, if wants to work for you, if nobody wants to do something with you, it means you're not the business person. That's why for me it's a different criteria about how we are measuring the success of the school. It will become a very important discussion for the future of the 21st uh, century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruben. Just as a small remark, uh, ben Nielsen, the founder of Minerva Universities here at Gaidar Forum, he would be speaking at one of the sessions and uh, in fact I, I, I have to meet him in a couple of hours. He's a great guy. It's not the first time he's speaking here. Uh, and second, I have just very, very small question to Ruben. J -j very, very small. Uh, you see, when we started working with one of our outstanding, progressive, big company, and when we're discussing what we shall do about the internship of our students, I got a very good message. The people told me, uh, I shall say in Russian, then I shall say in English, because from my point of view, it's not that easy to translate. Uh, Sergei Pavlovich, сказали мне... Uh, so what they told me, and this were guys from the Carpet Academy, we need to discuss agile-oriented projects so that your students, after the short internship, can deliver pitches or TED sessions. You see, uh, we have to think about agile-oriented method of teaching so that after short uh, internship, your students would make pitch or TED session at Gemba. Uh, you see, if, if I had to tell the same, I would tell the same with absolutely different words. Does it mean that today we have to retrain our professors to speak the language of the new generation? Because the same meaning has absolutely different vocabulary. No, I think we are touching very <coughs> dangerous area of the professors will be mad about what I will say now. But one of the biggest challenges that we are facing in all our programs how much professor spending time for his own self-development? How much really, we're talking about self-development, life learning, why talking about only students? Why are we not talking about who is teaching these to do the same? Or do we ever putting the same requirements for all of us who already feel we're successful and we know what we are doing, we can already teach and explain? It's, it's a joke, it's begun. We are talking about self life learning, self-development for everybody, including the professors. Why it's no chance to continue to stay in a, public or active role in your life if you're not self-developing. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to give floor to our next outstanding presenter, to Professor Eric Lamarck, Sorbonne. Thanks you, thank you, uh, Sergey, uh, and, and thanks to have uh, invited me to this, uh, to this panel, and I was very pleased to, to meet uh, very brilliant uh, speakers. Uh, at the beginning, at the beginning, uh, I see the question: Are classical business schools nearing the end? Wow! I say we have uh, many questions to, uh, to, uh, to to think. And why here in in Russia you have this uh, idea? Uh, because in many countries, I see that the the model of business school is uh, is a question. And I was just to mention that I am also a, a member of the French Ministry of Higher Education. Uh, on the question of business schools. So uh, we are thinking at, the, at the, the government level of what is the future of business school and the, the, the role of private business school, public business school, and so on. So why do you have a question? But because I think one additional point uh, from the two uh, previous speakers is, in fact, the question of management and the management in universities. Many people consider that management is not a science. Management is more a question of art of management. Entrepreneurship, no, is not management. It is a, a, a spirit. It is something you have in your mind. So or more than using techniques, more than using uh, methodology. So in many cases, and it is a, so, sometimes a case in France, we have difficulty 
to, uh, for, for management and management science to be recognized inside uh, universities. And why do we ask the question of the end of business school? It's because we see management appearing in school of engineer, in school of tourism, in school of design, and in fact, many, many, many people is doing management, and so the question of the existence of business schools sometimes is really questioned. So uh, the, the problem is, and I fully agree with you, when you say the business school will continue to exist if they respond, really, to the needs of the society and to the needs of companies, of organizations who want to uh, integrate new graduates in, uh, in, their, in their structure. So my, my point, uh, in addition to, to not repeat what uh, they have, uh, what have been said, is to say that, and, and you speak about the, the role of professor and the position of professor. We, are, we have a, a, a difficulty in, in the business school, I think, in the traditional model, and I, I agree we have to integrate technologies, we have to integrate a new preoccupation for young people and so on and so on. Uh, I, I agree with the fact we have to improve uh, the experience of students inside our business school, okay. But the problem is, and I don't know if people know that precisely, is that if you want to be recognized as an international, international business school, you have to, uh, you, you must have accreditation, you have to be recognized by international standards. And inside these international standards, you have one dimension about research and the result of research. And research, to be uh, uh, very well ranked on research, you have to publish in peer-reviewed journals. And when you look at the contents in peer-reviewed journals, it is far from the needs of companies, very far. It is more you have to comply with the requirement of the academic community in terms of uh, uh, rigor, in terms of uh, number of data, in terms of different things, very interesting to uh, prove something perhaps in a paper, but imagine that a journal, I am professor of finance, a journal like the Journal of Finance, the number one journal, academic journal in finance, each paper is read by more or less five or 10 people in the world. So you can have uh, online documents and what you want. So the, the research we produce in business school to be to comply with the uh, best requirement is a research with small interest for companies. So people, professors in business schools, to be uh, academic recognized professor, to be part of the standards of a ranking, have to publish and have to take a long time of its journey to make this publication. So after that, it's difficult to uh, master the new technology in the uh, programs, to uh, improve the uh, pedagogy and the capacity to be a, a good teacher. It's difficult to meet companies, uh, to discuss regularly with companies to see if the knowledge they teach to people uh, correspond to what happen uh, really in, uh, in companies and what are the needs for the, for the future. So I think that uh, if we uh, continue uh, to have these requirements in terms of publication. At the end, we need to have two kinds of professors. The professor who publish to comply with the criteria and the standards, and professors who are teachers uh, who uh, develop, you know, uh, who innovate in terms of uh, blended uh, program and so on and so on. So I think we have uh, a main issue also. It is uh, one point which, which I think it is uh, it was not mentioned by the previous speakers. We, ha we have an issue in business school with the profile of, uh, of the professor. And uh, that's why you have, and in the, in the question asked on the, for the panel, you have uh, the role of corporate universities, you have the role of pure private business school without any accreditation. What happened? In fact, many, many uh, organizations, like companies itself, like pure private business school out of all the accreditation who make proposal to students, to companies, and they develop their program themselves without any contact with the academic world. 
and you have some programs in some business schools who are delivered by only practitioner and professional without any academic professor. So the competition now is between the research business school and the pure teaching business school in many, many places. But that's why you can ask the question, do we need actually business school in the traditional model? So my, my point is to say, perhaps we have to rethink of the profile of a professor in the business school. Uh, in one orientation, I, I compare a lot business studies and management research as medicine. For me, it's impossible and uh, 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 medics uh, have the two sides of the activity. He make research and he practice also. The best professor in university hospital do the, the two. So for me, uh, it is uh, the, the future of a business school is to have more professors who at one moment in his life have also the experience of managing department of companies or managing companies or have created a company or are an entrepreneur itself. So that's one orientation we are looking for in the new profile of professor. They must have a PhD. They must have a, a good connection with the research and the research uh, scientific reasoning, but also they should have experience at one moment of his professional life as practitioner. This is the first point. The second point is also, we speak a lot about universities and business schools, but I, I am also a member of a board of different companies and I was the CEO of a consulting firm several years ago. Uh, I see also that the companies, when they receive graduates, uh, I do, I'm not sure that all the companies accept the new ideas bring by the new graduates. And they put the graduates in the norms, internal norms, defined by the company. If you are a young graduate, if you uh, come with a diploma from a very good university or business school like a uh, uh, university, I'm not sure that if you come at the first meeting with other manager, your new ideas you have learned, you take from the business school, are listened, are taken by the company itself. They have, you have to wait a moment to be perhaps at the good position in the management of, of, of the company. So com I, I'm not sure always company are, uh, uh, um, want, want really to, uh, to play the game with us. Long, long life learning, okay? But do we accept in easily in company each five years that the manager go outside and take new uh, training programs? Not in France, for what I know, not, not, not really. They, they don't like people uh, come back to the university, uh, take time for that, uh, be disturbed by uh, new exam and, and so on. So uh, on the side of companies also, I think if you want to improve the capacity to transform, the capacity to better manage the company, I think also that the company have to make efforts to uh, combine the uh, business, the, the business as usual, also have with the, the, the weights of the staff and the manager to uh, regularly modify their knowledge, improve the knowledge in order to continue to be updated in, the, uh, in terms of uh, manager and quality of the management. So, so I think if we want to improve the efficiency of companies, and this is the role of business school to produce graduates who improve the efficiency of companies, I think also the companies have to be more organized to integrate the new knowledge bring by these people. Thanks. Th thank you very much, Eric. Uh, also, if you permit, a very quick, small question. We're speaking about research, we're speaking about innovation, we speak uh, how to preserve the role of uh, business schools as innovators. But innovations today, they're coming from innovational startups. And these startuppers, they are not really wealthy people. My son, uh, who initiated startup four years ago, he told me after two years, Dad, we came to the new level of our company. 
Now we have break even and the Chirac profit. I just, I just uh, the Chirac profit for those who doesn't know the Chirac that's a brand of South Korean noodles, fast food, where you put boiled water and you get your food. Not very tasty, not very healthy, but eatable. So, so he told me, we have the profit to have lunch with the Chirac, not the, uh, the profit to pay our a good uh, salary. So, so those people are not wealthy. And the leading business schools, they are working with the top people from the top companies. How can we redirect business schools? taken into consideration the financial uh, considerations to, to the needs of those innovational startups? Uh, I, I, think, I think that uh, it's one, one m my idea is that for the future of the business education, uh, I don't know if I'm right, but I think that it is important to develop at, for the students the uh, scientific reasoning. I think that we have to improve the capacity of students, mm -hmm. not only to uh, apply methodology and so on, but to modify the methodology and to modify the concept itself. And so I think in the future, that's why you have new program, not MBA, but DBA, and uh, PhD, executive PhD, I think in the future we are going to develop this kind of program, different from the MBA, in order to put in mind of people that don't accept all the methodologies, don't accept all the concepts like this, but you are able to transform this concept and methodology if you apply a scientific method. And now, uh, now I think in the future we are going to develop programs more oriented on teaching scientific method in order to have people able to change the concept and to change methodologies. Thank you very much. And now uh, it's my pleasure to give floor to the last but not the least speaker, uh, representative of journalistics with big experience of business, uh, to uh, Mr. Ilya Doronov. Uh, once I heard a very good sentence in English. In English, it sounds, any talk is cheap unless you are talking with the lawyer. And I consider that today, any discussion is not full if the representative of the fifth power, if the representatives of journalistics are not participating in this discussion. So it's my pleasure to give floor to Ilya Daronov. Большое спасибо. Я буду оригинален, буду говорить по-русски в России, да? Well, uh, when in Russia, talk uh, Russian. So uh, I'll try to share the experience uh, of uh, the uh, fifth power. So are the classical, classical business schools nearing the end? And what about, in general, what about classic schools? Are they nearing their end? And what about our classic lifestyle, the traditional way of life that existed before the news, before this century? Is it nearing its end? So you talked about millennials. What about Zoomers? What about the Z generation, those who have replaced millennials? According to one of the classifications, those who were born between 1995 and 2010, it's a they are an exciting sight to see because before that we've never had a generation like that. Before then we've never had a generation that was born in the digital world, who are digital natives. So what's the contrast to us? Some of you could be uh, pigeonholed into that category. I was born in 1978, and for me, real people will never re be replaced by uh, some augmented reality. But for the Z generation, real and virtual friends are the same. If you ban their page at uh, Facebook or uh, VK, the Russian version of uh, Facebook, if you take their phone away, phone away, they'll be really angry. We'll be angry too. But 
The answer to that question that you put uh, in the headline, I would say yes. Classical business schools are nearing the end. That transformation is ongoing. We are living at a time at a global disruptive uh, change. I've worked on TV for all my life. And that used to be the mainstream classic TV. If, if we do a roll call, who's watching TV? I might see who watches TV. And there might be three hands, no more. People would say they have different watching consumption habits. You might have smart TV, you have YouTube app on your phone, and you put together your pro own programming. The same will take place in education. Now, we used to watch uh, Channel 1 or Channel 2. Back in my young years, there would be just two TV channels. Right now, you take content from different channels, from different supply, content suppliers, and you put together your own programming. The same could happen with education. You would piece together your own puzzle. So I've what I've encountered is that many people are ready to change. There's one region in Russia where we have a course uh, in uh, uh, PR, in media relations, and one of the officials rose up and said, no, we need to crack, to crack down on that. He just left the lecture, so people aren't ready. And we're also seeing a disconnect, a gap between different generations. We have these Zoomers, we have Millennials, and we have baby boomers, the ones who were born right after World War II. They live in a parallel world, at least that seems to me. The baby boomers and the Zoomers. That's a, here's a very clear example, very illustrative one. Again, some officials were sent to, to be trained and they seem to be willing to acquire new knowledge. So I'm talking to them, I ask them a question. You, we all know TNT, Comedy Club and other entertainment TV channels. And you know, some youngsters uh, don't really get the jokes uh, from these old uh, comedy uh, club uh, stand-up comedians. So again, I'm not advertising anything. Do you know who's Danila Paperechny? Can you raise a hand? Well, most of you know who he is. And so we have a classroom of officials and there would be just two or three hands that went up. And then I showed him a, a picture picture of uh, the Ice Palace in St. Petersburg, 12,000 people, and it's fully packed. Uh, you have a stand-up comedian, no special effects, just one mic, and he captures the audience. And, and uh, I told him, you know what he's talking about? No. And I asked those officials, you know that uh, he went, uh, he came to your city, to your town with a big concert, and they're not aware of that. So we need to bridge that gap through education, through lectures, through extra motivation so that people would be eager to learn about that. So we talked a lot about new technology, distant learning, wow room, okay, whatever. What is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to make education more affordable. So we had Denmark, Mexico, the US, everyone's uh, just at arm's length. So on the one hand, people are saying it's becoming affordable, but on the other hand, I have a question, why it's becoming more expensive? Now, if we want people to develop further, we can give them the technology, but the price of that education is a kind of a barrier. 
It bars you from getting that education. I might be wrong, but that's my impression. What's important is to ensure that there's a perfect balance in the world when you combine in different things. If you move into digital education, distant education, then you will no longer be able to communicate with a professor, you won't have a face-to-face -face communication, and you'll never be able to communicate or chat with a professor the way we do here. Imagine you're sitting in the comfort of your homes and we are talking over Skype. That would be a different feel to it. So when you end your lecture, you, you might be impressed by the great audience or you might be exhausted and you would have to be silent for another two hours, you know, to recoup. You, you know, we, there's an exchange of energy between the audience and the speaker. And one of the most popular questions uh, of people who leave this world in the U.S. is uh, why have I worked so much in my life? Again, we need to have that uh, leisure work balance. When we only have time to relax on the weekend, that's not enough. No matter how smart you are, and again, you might have the best of education, you would just burn out, and you don't have the motivation, you don't have the strength to apply those skills. You just don't want, you just don't want anything. Now, going back to the balance once again, there are a lot of people in the modern world, you know, who do marathons. You know, marathons are a popular thing right now. You, open Facebook and uh, people do this Iron Man stuff and they have marathons all around the world. That's just another notch on the belt, you know. It's just to uh, show off on social media. And here's a warning for education. You might, they might say, that, now here's a training I did, here's another training I did, that's another course I did. And you just do it for the sake of getting another diploma. And as Mr. Masayadov said, okay, we need to teach people more and more. But what's the outcome? What's the ultimate learning outcome that we would like to get? I'm not a businessman per se, but in terms of us as consumers and in terms of the business community, well, the business community would say that all of the business processes need to be better and we need to get a higher revenue. But I'll be a little provocative here, but if you look through the eyes of the uh, consumer, those who uh, repair household or consumer electronics would say that currently electronics is much worse. So why is quality worse, given that education is better? So maybe education is all about uh, making more money on people. That's, uh, you know, kind of a provocative question, but that's what we need to bear in mind. It seems that with all the new technology, it seems to be perfect. But very often you would say from your car mechanic that, you know, German cars are not the way it used to be. You know, Japanese car makers are still more or less, but Toyota is not the, what it used to be. So they would break in three or four years time. Also, can you teach leadership? What is more important, the person's energy or his, their knowledge? You're either born with it or not. Maybe Ruben can respond to it. Can you teach leadership skills so that people would be able to promote the project? Now, here's another interesting thing. Now, those millennials, they were born before 1995. And Santiago talked about the Western world. And I have a question. How could education, how could the education have looked if the are made, you know, the Spanish would have beaten the British in that war. The world would be a different place, not the Anglo-Saxon oriented one. 
and the fat years are over. The lean years are on. And there's some new research by McKinsey done in Brazil on the Z generation. The Zoomers were grew up uh, during an economic crisis. You remember the 2008, well, everything started with Argentina, then Brazil, then we were hit. Oh, sorry, it, was, it all started in the US. And that also had an impact on the people that uh, shaped their childhood. When you're born a during a global economic crisis, you treat money, you treat it, skills and education differently. And they say that Zoomers, at least in Brazil, is more pragmatic than millennials. And for them, freelance is not that important. They need a permanent job. So it's all moving in circles, and we are just moving along this new spiral. We are getting to the same old model that we used to have, but at a different level. Well, I've been speaking for too long, I guess. Where else do I have? And here's another point on Russia. And I think we can resolve those issues together with the schools, together with the media. Unfortunately, there's a negative attitude to, towards business schools in Russia. And you're well aware of that. So when you have uh, scalpers, you know, who uh, uh, sell tickets at triple the price and they call themselves entrepreneurs or innovators, well, we don't respect those people. What can they teach us? Okay, talk about rankings. We know how they are put together. And as I said, you, you need to take into account this uh, post-truth, this post-honesty. That's what uh, Santiago mentioned earlier. And the role of professors is changing. I used to, I spent two years in teaching at a school, and you're looked up as a source of knowledge. That was in the past. But today, every word uttered by the professor is uh, double checked. Uh, online. So is the role the same? Do we need to be the source of knowledge? Should we accumulate the knowledge or should we, you know, somehow bring together the new knowledge and skills or look at the new knowledge and skills that are being born right in that audience during class? So as a sum up, classic TV, classic business schools and everything, or most of classic, that's nearing their end. But we'll see a lot of new things that's emerging right in front of our own eyes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ilya. Now, we, before we give uh, uh, the floor, we give the, the floor to the audience. You talked about happiness, leadership and the burnout phenomenon at 4 p.m. Just for the audience, we'll have a session by Rick Van Damme, and he is present here. And I'll finish off in English. Special session where Professor Nick Van Damme, who used to be the head of McKinsey Research Center of Leadership for about 15 years and now is working at uh, the University and Business School of Santiago. Uh, Nick Van Dam would be speaking about the results of his research and about the correlation of leadership, happiness, biological age of the people, productivity of labor, leaf life balance, and all, all other things. Very interesting presentation from my point of view. Th this is just an information. And one small, very small question to Ilya. Parusky. Ilya. Now, I asked my question in Russia. You said that for many people, uh, doing courses or jumping between courses is a kind of hobby. There's a, a such a, a notion as overvalued professors. Uh, now, if I get a CV and it says that I'm a great, outstanding, renowned professor and you have 10, 15 courses at training sessions that the person has attended in the past 10 or 10, 12 years, 
I understand that this is part of lifelong learning. But from practice, I know that such people cannot read a work. They always listen to someone, but they don't have time to digest that information. And now, what about your industry? Now, if you have a journalist who uh, how, see, attends a lot of trainings, is it a bonus or is it a disadvantage? Again, you need to have a balance. You need There needs to be lifelong learning, but you need to have time for practice. When I worked at REN TV, a different TV channel, and we had interns from uh, the very famous uh, a university, you think initially that uh, they uh, would be great, but they didn't have any practice and we didn't need them because theoretical knowledge is one thing and practice is a different thing. So you need to combine the two. If a journalist just attends training sessions and there's no practice, it's highly unlikely we'll, we'll need such a person. We know that there are a lot of journalists without uh, a specific uh, um, training. So I'm not a journalist by the profession, by vocation, but uh, I was not trained to be one, but I'm a journalist. And today we live in a world when we have uh, to always get new skills and to readjust. So practice is the best judge here. And I thank you so much. We have time for several more questions. Well, I have um, another point. Business schools will soon teach digital detox. We'll need to have such uh, courses, how to get rid of the digital noise, how to learn to concentrate, how to stop your hand from checking your phone. And again, that's one of the challenges. Good morning, Mr. Schwarke. I'm Sergei Schwarke. The current Russian education system relies on competencies. If you look at the Russian national standard, you will have general competencies, professional competencies. I don't really like that kind of paradigm. We know that we got that approach back in the 1980s, and it was all taken from Noam Chomsky. Usually, education is split into two components, fundamental knowledge and applied knowledge. We talked about balance today. So here's my question. What's your take? Which side to take? What kind of knowledge should we teach? Which are more in demand, fundamental or practical skills, applied skills? I am a practicing lawyer. I teach law. And I did, a res I did research on the 18th century. So what's your question? I'm sorry. So take Russia. I know we had a first a shift uh, towards uh, fundamental knowledge, then a pivot to applied knowledge. Now we have a pivot to uh, some competences. What is the right balance? What should be the right balance between fundamental and applied knowledge? Well, what is more important uh, in contemporary education? And my second question. Okay, can you please uh, make your question crisp and clear? Do we need to focus on our bringing during uh, business education? Because in classic si classical science, you have this aspect of upbringing, good manners and stuff like that. First, what we have to decide what is fundamental knowledge and applied knowledge. Uh, I think that uh, uh, you have research and application. So we, ha we, we should have 
the two. When you say that when you take the students and they are not adapted to the uh, practice or to uh, the, the techniques in the company and so on, now I think it's not more possible. It's not more possible. The business schools have to teach to, pe to people and at the end, people, young, young, young graduates, should be uh, employable immediately in the companies. Of course, you need some moment, some weeks or months of adaptation, but normally the break between what we call fundamental, fundamental means theoretical, and applied means practical knowledge. So I, I think we have to change also this, this vision of the teaching. I think that, of course, you need a basis of fundamental knowledge if we accept this, uh, this, this point, but in, at, at, at one moment during the uh, student life, uh, you, you, you need to have also application. In many universities, you share the two, you have uh, academic professor for fundamentals and you have practitioner for the uh, applicable knowledge. In fact, what, what we want to do, perhaps us, is to modify a little the vision I like, I should like, as a dean of a business school, a professor who are able to speak about the fundamentals, but also to speak of a practice. So, or you say fundamental is for academics and practical is for practitioner, and you combine the two in a program, or you say I want to change the profile of my professor, and my professor in their own training activity have research, but also have to practice management in companies, and when they come back to the university or the school, they teach in this sense, and they share between uh, fundamental and apply. And the proportion will depend on people in front of you, and you have to adapt the proportion to the profile of your students. If I may just add um, to, to the very uh, smart comments of Eric, and I'm, I'm not going to, to confront uh, your very expert ideas, but. I recall Immanuel Kant, uh, the leading philosopher's comment on theory and practice. And he used to say that uh, there's not su such a difference between the two fields. They're just uh, constructs because every theory should be applicable into practice. Otherwise, it's about theory. So uh, when we talk about management or law or architecture or medicine, we are talking about clinical areas where the knowledge and the science and the models should actually adapt in the best possible way to the practice. Otherwise, they are bad theories. So my, my point is that, on the one hand, we should cultivate uh, the values and the virtues and the principles on our students and participants, and this requires probably a more generalist approach, and that's why the importance of the humanities that I was highlighting in my presentation but on the other hand, of course, we need to provide them with the employable skills that make them, you know, very, uh, very prompt to, to, to jump into the jobs market. But I wouldn't actually separate the two fields, theory and practice, and uh, fundamental and applied knowledge that sharply. Now, very briefly, I agree with what with a lot of what Ilya said. But what's the difference uh, between us and the Z generation? It was never the case in the history of humanity that the young generation teaches us something. Today, young people teach the older generation how to embrace technology. That's a very important aspect. Until the end of the 20th century, even until recently, the main purpose of education was to make it as affordable as possible. The social mandate of every state focused on making as many people literate as possible. So fighting illiteracy led to a situation where, uh, you know, the bar of uh, where a benchmark of who educated person is was became much, much lower. So going forward, there will be growing polarization. We're moving towards a world of antique times when there will be just an elite who will be versatile in terms of uh, their education. Education would be 
not affordable for the high poly. And that will be a challenge uh, for the uh, society to make it affordable. But there will be a polarization. There will be a two-layer system. You can't have 13,000 business schools. We don't need that amount of uh, philologists or historians. It's just an attempt to resolve some social issues. We're now entering a world where education will drive change, so we'll need to create value, and there will be fundamental changes in education, not just because of technology, but because uh, it's, won't, it will no longer be a social industry, it will become an economic industry. That will be a new phenomenon in our history. Yes, we are going back to what we used to have, and then someone would come to power saying that we need to fight illiteracy so there'll be a new a new level of that spiral a new step on that uh, stairway now here's another uh, story you know that Google IBM Starbucks no longer require higher education uh, certificate they just need a person with some set of theoretical skills theoretical knowledge and they would just mold them in their own way according to their own paradigm and which best practices of startup business schools business schools oriented towards startups can you recommend простите простите мне дали микрофон поэтому я позволю себе задать i'm sorry i think i was given the mic so let me ask this question uh, Unfortunately, what Sergey is saying is not audible. So, as long as uh, you know the representatives of the business schools uh, have dodged the question of uh, whether the business schools are nearing their end or not, let me provide a particular answer to this question referencing University of St. Gallen and uh, the Business School of St. Gallen, which ranks number three according to Financial Times Executive MBA ranking. So, uh, guys from St. Gallen came up with a digitalization initiative. They've got a business model navigator. I'm sorry, is that a question, sir? Uh, this is a question. So, they came up with a business model navigator and they are developing a curriculum now so that they can teach corporates in matters of uh, digital transformation and uh, well in fact strategic transformation precipitated by digital transformation. There is a monograph from uh, St. Gallen Business School, you know, they are publishing in Harvard Business Review, they are presenting at conferences and such. If somebody proposes a similar initiative to business schools, how would business schools respond? Do business schools like uh, the ones you represent here have the adaptive capability in order to transform their curricula in this uh, respect. Thank you. Uh, first, business schools have been the target every five years, you know, uh, from many different quarters. So we are actually accustomed to uh, being, you know, the favorite uh, objective of, of all sorts of criticisms. And the MBA has been, uh, for many, many different reasons, you know, many times criticized and uh, many people thought it was going to disappear. But fortunately, the MBA is the hottest ticket still in the market. And business schools uh, are still, you know, becoming the icebreakers of higher education on many different fronts. But boy, going back to your question, I'm not familiar with uh, the particular device that St. Gallen, which is a very good school, has developed. But I'm sure that all our schools are actually producing research which is not uh, just uh, rigorous, as Eric was uh, mentioning, but also relevant to the actual business world. We are clinical institutions that uh, develop not just uh, pure knowledge, but actually solutions that fit the actual needs of managers and, and companies. No? But let me just comment very quickly on something that Ilya said before. Of course, some companies like IBM and others are now hiring people and persuading 
some candidates coming fresh from high schools to skip universities. I guess that's an error. And one of the reasons why companies are very quick, you know, to hire people without uh, degrees is because they are cheaper. They are cheaper. I mean, they can actually offer lower salaries, no? So I would actually dissuade any potential student from skip university studies because they provide a very rich education in terms of generalist knowledge, no? Thank you very, very much. Very quickly, if you please. Yes. Mm -hmm. you, are, you have a very uh, clear indicator if you want to know if your proposal and what you give at the MBA level is relevant. When you discuss with the MBA candidate, you, 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 you speak with him about what he wants to do and what kind of capabilities he wants to have and how, how it would, uh, with, with, with courses he wants to have. At the end, you ask to people, do you think that the time you take for the MBA has really improve your professional capaci capacity, capabilities, and now are you stronger than before? If 80 or 90% of people say yes, I think you uh, reach the target. Yeah, thank you very, very much. Уважаемые друзья, нам организаторы говорят, что время I'm sorry, dear friends, uh, we are told by the organizers uh, the time has run out. Our time is over. They need to change to restrict the hall for the next session, also dedicated to business education. So you're mostly welcome. So please join me in thanking our distinguished presenters.